So what was the significance of the Trump presidency? What did it betoken in terms of the world order? You know, it's both unbelievably dangerous and also kind of very predictable, even though it wasn't predicted in the sense that, you know, all of these pre-existing forces were at work and, um, and, and he just followed this path and uh, and and so he's like just kind of this logical outcome of, of this worship of wealth, you know, reality TV, rising racism and xenophobia, you know, all of it mixed in. That's why in my speech today I compared him to the fatberg under London's um, sewer system because it's sort of like this thing of just like all that is disgusting in the culture just kind of glomming together in the form of this, you know, this guy, you know, he's, he's just like filling that suit with all of it. And, um, and, and you know, it's, it, 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 sometimes it's just, it seems almost funny, but it's not at all funny. I mean, what he's doing right now, um, you know, as we speak, Puerto Rico is, is uh, without power, without water, in the midst of a heat wave, without communications. He's tweeting about the fact that they have a big debt they have to pay off and positioning it to privatize their electricity system. And, uh, and so we've got that. Um, and this is consistent with the fact that his whole presidency is, you know, I've called it a corporate coup. It is just um, the mask is off, right? So not, none of this is new, you know, corporate power in U.S. elections and U.S. politics. This is not a new phenomenon that Trump invented. But he's just taken the mask off, right? So you've got, you know, the CEO of Exxon as Secretary of State. You've got five Goldman Sachs executives running the economy. And then you've got Trump and his family who are this sort of family of fully commercialized brands profiting day in, day out from the presidency. Let's talk about another great American political brand, the Clintons. Um, at the same time that Bernie Sanders is bringing together a coalition around uh, universal health care in a quite meaningful sense, mm -hmm. um, Hillary Clinton is doing a book tour. I think she earned $40 million potentially from this new book she's published. I'm very glad that's not my publisher anymore. <laughs> Who are you angrier at? I shouldn't say that. Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton? <laughs> Very nice people. Who am I angrier at? Yeah, who's, 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 who, who personally, you know, in, you know, in terms of your physiology, who do you feel more let down by? Honestly, I think both of them are exactly who they have been um, for, for as long as I can remember. I'm not surprised by what Hillary is doing. Um, and, you know, one would hope that there would be some lessons learned, real lessons learned. I mean, she's written this book, uh, which is supposedly about what happened and what went wrong, and there's all kinds of blame to go around, and she takes a little for herself, and she names various mistakes um, in various moments, and the Russians, and Comey, and Bernie. Um, she, she does not fundamentally in any way understand that, she did, that, that, that people are hurting out there, and that her brand of politics, the politics that um, that, that she represents, represented as Secretary of State, the politics that her husband represented um, as president, um, produced this moment. It's part of what produced this moment. It did not, does not meet people's needs. It has overseen a um, rise in precarious work and collapse of living standards. Um, it can't get the job done on all of these different fronts. And that's what creates such fertile ground for demagogues to step in with these completely fake solutions, um, fake economic populism, very real racism, mix it all together and stir. Um, so I think Trump is who Trump has always been. You know, when he was a New York real estate developer, he, um, and that's all he was, he used race baiting um, to uh, advance his career, uh, took out full page ads attacking um, you know, young men who have been exonerated for the crime that they were accused of, the Central Park Five. Um, so he, 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 he is who he's always been, but with more power. Um, and so is Hillary Clinton. So I'm not mad at them for being themselves. Um, you know, I think I'm more worried that Democrats 
a lot of key Democrats can't seem to learn this mess this lesson. So we had quite a different outcome in this country to the US. Mm -hmm. Over there, Bernie Sanders lost the nomination, Hillary Clinton won. Meanwhile, over here, Jeremy Corbyn won two leadership races. He may now, it seems, be the next prime minister. There's a conversation going on over there in Labour Party conference, where you spoke today, mm -hmm. uh, between the moderates and the left of the party, which mm -hmm. is the mainstream of the party. Similar conversation in the US, different balance of powers. Mm -hmm. To what extent can these people be in a coalition for transformation? Is it not possible? Because they're not interested in it, and furthermore, they don't seem to have the, the social base, which is even of much use. Um. Are they our friends? <laughs> are the likes of Hillary Clinton or Hillary Benn or Chuck Roman, are they, are they part of changing the world? I think it depends if they can change. I mean, if all they're going to do is fail to learn from the lessons of the past um, and try to drag this project to some idea of the safe center, which is not safe. It is not safe from an economic or ecological perspective in that it, its policies do not fundamentally address um, these very urgent crises that, that we face. And they're not safe electorally. I mean, this is the whole point. Hillary Clinton had this air of inevitability about her because she was seen as this supremely safe candidate who had all the money, all the backing, all the you know boxes ticked, right? And you know this incredibly focused group, safe center, try to make everybody just a teeny bit happy, but not too happy campaign, and it fell flat. I mean, she did win the electoral vote, but she she did not manage to um, to energize her base, and in key states. Uh, a far too large part of her constituency stayed home. So it's not that Trump was elected on this wave of anger and hatred. I mean, he did not have a huge mandate, right? This is why he's constantly going on and on about how, you know, there was vote stealing and all of this. It drives him mad. He did not win the electoral vote. He does not have a landslide victory. Hillary Clinton lost the election. She did not energize her base. And she most certainly did not reach into constituencies that have just tuned out from electoral politics because it doesn't offer them any. And in the United States, that constituency is 90 million people. You know, people spend so much time. And this, is, I think, is one of the things that, um, you know, we in North America really need to learn from what you did here in the UK and specifically what Momentum did and just not accepting the logic that you know that these people aren't worth um, reaching because they don't vote, or this you know this riding isn't worth going after. We call them ridings, you know that um, because you know we can't win. They went they, they went after traditional non-voters and managed to galvanize them. So there's all of this sort of minute debate go, that goes on about you know how much of Trump's white working class base can be peeled away, and that, to me that's so much less interesting then how do you speak to the 90 million Americans who, are, who didn't vote? Thank you, Naomi. <laughs> Cheers.